Hi, this is Elio from EO Nutrition and in today's video we are going to be looking at some of the reasons why someone may experience chronic diarrhea on a carnival diet and that when they introduce plants back into the diet it actually improves things. So over the past couple of months I've had several clients who have come to me who've tried carnival, who've tried an animal-based approach and have found that they actually develop chronic diarrhea. So we have tried multiple different approaches. We have increased the fat and reduced the protein or increased the protein and reduced the fat. We have done one meal a day. We've taken out uh, refined fats. We've done time restricted feeding. We have tried supplements such as ox bile and pancreatic enzymes. Nothing has worked, okay? And the general consensus online is that this may be due to excess protein or it could also be due to a lack of bile. But I haven't really been satisfied with this answer because it doesn't match up with my clinical experience working with people. So there is a common theme among all of these individuals and it seems to be that when they incorporate plant fiber or plant foods back into the diet, it stops the diarrhea. Okay, so I saw this and I, I was asking questions. Why might this be the case? What do plants have that can stop diarrhea? It doesn't really make sense in the context of insufficient bile uh, or excess protein. Now, if you know anything about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, then you will know that plant fiber generally tends to make things worse. And so these people do not fit with the classical SIBO presentation. In fact, plant fiber improves their condition and improves their digestion. So I did a bit of digging and I have come to the conclusion that for many of these individuals, it's not an issue where they are not producing enough bile. In fact, it's the opposite. I think that what it relates to is that their liver is producing too much bile and they are unable to effectively put a stop to that. So in today's video, we'll look at the mechanism for how this happens and what you might be able to do about it to improve your condition. This condition is referred to as bile acid malabsorption or bile acid diarrhea. So first of all, let's take a look at some of the basic functions of bile and then move on to the mechanism of how this might work. So to begin, just a brief overview. The two main functions of bile for the purpose of this video is to support the breakdown and the absorption of dietary fats and fat soluble vitamins and also to excrete metabolic waste products and xenobiotic toxins. Okay, so first of all, to digest and absorb dietary fat, we require enough bile. Bile acids are synthesized in the liver from cholesterol via an enzyme system called CYP7A1. The primary bile acids are cholic acid and kinodeoxycholic acid, CDCA abbreviated. These bile acids are then bound with or conjugated with two amino acids. One of those is taurine and the other one is glycine. And then when they are conjugated, they are then excreted into the bile and they are stored in the gallbladder in preparation for a meal. So when you consume dietary fats, uh, this triggers the release of a hormone called cholecystokinin. And this hormone then goes on to trigger um, the muscle cells lining the gallbladder. Basically, it causes them to contract. And when the gallbladder contracts, this causes bile to flush into the upper portion of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. So in the duodenum, when food contents have come from the stomach, you have this flush of bile from the gallbladder, and this is where bile starts to emulsify fats. It means that they can then be acted on by various enzymes to actually allow them to be broke down further and to be absorbed. However, it's worth noting that the bile, bile synthesis is a relatively costly process, um, and so it takes a lot of resources to make. And really the body will try to make best use of its materials by recycling those bile acids. So you have a total bile acid pool, so to speak. But what you're doing is you are essentially, you're releasing these bile acids and then you are reabsorbing them. Okay, they're reabsorbed in the lower part of the small intestine called the ileum. And this is approximately 95% of them are reabsorbed. 
Okay, so reabsorption in that ileum um, occurs through these transport proteins located on the, the cells of the intestinal wall, and one of those is called ASBT. So aside from the 95% of bile acids which are recycled, you have about 5% of those which are going down into the colon. Some of those bile acids that escape into the colon are deconjugated by certain bacteria, and then some of those are absorbed once again. Now, when the bile acids are absorbed, they enter into portal circulation and travel back to the liver to be recycled. In a pro this process is called enterohepatic recycling. So here, reconjugated, what's happening is the liver is taking these bile acids, they've already been used, and they are reconjugating them with different amino acids and sending them back to the gut. So during a meal, you can cycle bile acids multiple different times, and this will happen many times throughout the day. Now, this is how it's ordinarily meant to work, this recycling process. The problem is, in bile acid malabsorption or bile acid diarrhea, this process goes wrong. So when bile is not sufficiently reabsorbed or there is an excess of bile acids, then you have increased amount of bile entering into the colon. And the colon is not designed to um, deal with excess bile acids, okay? Bile acids are toxic to the cells lining the colon, the mucosal cells, and so the body needs to do something about this. What happens is, is that actually excess bile in the colon will influence the electrolyte concentrations and trigger diarrhea. It draws water into the colon and actually causes someone to have very loose stools or frequent diarrhea. So this condition is actually a lot more common than has been previously thought. In fact, it's said to make up approximately 30% of individuals with IBS-D um, which means that people who've been diagnosed with IBS or SIBO may actually have this condition. It's said also to be very undiagnosed or underdiagnosed. Question is, who gets this condition? Well, this is very common in something like Crohn's disease or when someone ha has had part of their small intestine cut out. So in, in, in an il ileal bowel um, resection, then what actually happens is that we have that portion of the ileum which is cut out of the body and we no longer have the ability to reabsorb those bile acids. Likewise, in Crohn's disease, what happens is, is when there is inflammation in the gut, then this can actually affect the transport proteins which are facilitating the reabsorption of bile. However, in this case, this condition is referred to as secondary bile acid malabsorption because this is occurring secondary to a different condition, such as Crohn's disease. But for the large majority of people, this condition is not secondary to anything and is actually referred to as primary bile acid malabsorption. Now, for people with primary bile acid malabsorption, there is actually no problem with reabsorption of bile per se. They can reabsorb it into the ileal cells quite well, but rather, these people simply make too much bile. So to understand how this works, we need to look at something called the FXR-FGF19 axis. So what does that mean? Well, there is something called the Farsenoid X receptor, and this receptor is a nuclear hormone receptor located on the cells of the ileum. Okay? It binds with bile acids, and so when you reabsorb bile acids in that portion of the small intestine, you have the binding of those bile acids with this FXR receptor, and this is going to go on to activate the transcription of many different genes, some of those involved in glucose and fat metabolism, other times liver function, and also in gut in integrity. Okay, so one of those genes that is activated by the FXR receptor is coding for a protein called FGF19. So when the bile acids are reabsorbed, they bind with the Farsenoid X receptor, which then activates the production of this FGF19. And FGF19 travels through the portal blood into the liver. And when it gets into the liver, it inhibits an enzyme called CYP7A1. 
Now, this is exactly the same enzyme which is responsible for synthesizing new bile acids. So what that means is that essentially it's causing a negative feedback loop. Okay, essentially this system allows the body to know when it is reabsorbing old bile acids so that it doesn't need to make any new ones. Okay, the reabsorption of those bile acids is this signal to the liver to stop production. So when FXR is activated, that tells the liver stop making bile acids. Okay, and it means that you can then recycle the other ones. But when this feedback system, this information system becomes broken, this actually leads to an excess production of bile acids in the liver and this causes bile acid diarrhea. So as I said, people with bile acid malabsorption, they don't have any problem with reabsorbing bile acids. The problem is, is that they do not have activation of FXR for whatever reason. So they're not activating FXR. The signal is not getting to the liver to tell it to stop making bile acids and they end up with, a, with an increased pool of total bile acids which gets to the colon and causes diarrhea. This means that a dysregulated feedback mechanism between the gut and the liver is likely responsible for this condition. So interestingly, there is research to support this. Serum levels of FGF19 have been shown to be low in patients with bile acid malabsorption. Um, the level of FGF19 is actually correlated with the severity of diarrhea. Fasting FGF19 transcripts are also low in these patients. Furthermore, FXR activators such as obeticolic acid, which is a synthetic bile acid analog, this has been shown to significantly increase the serum levels of FGF19. It decreases bile acid synthesis and it also improves diarrhea and stool form in these patients. So activating F FXR is really, really important. Bile acid sequestrants have also been used to manage this condition. So there is something called cholestyramine, and this is enormously effective at improving stool formation in bile acid malabsorption. This is because excess bile acids are being bound in the gut, and this is unable to initiate diarrhea when it reaches the colon. Now, interestingly, the soluble fiber, which you find in vegetables, grains and some fruits has actually been found to bind bile acids as well. So common vegetables like beets, kale, eggplant and okra um, also bind bile acids quite effectively. So I suspect that this might actually be the reason why when people add back in some vegetables, they notice that the diarrhea disappears. I think the fiber in the vegetables is binding up excess bile acids and preventing them getting like free into the colon so that it causes diarrhea. And so just to recap, we know that people who have bile acid malabsorption or bile acid diarrhea, there's an issue with FXR, there's an issue with this protein in the intestinal lining or in the intestinal cells of the ileum and this is not sending the correct feedback signal to the liver and that these people produce too many bile acids. We know that actually targeting FXR with specific bile acid analogs such as obeticolic acid or by binding those excess bile acids with fiber in the gut can prevent diarrhea that is predominant in this condition. But now we have to try to understand why FXR is not being activated in these people. So what is actually driving this condition in the first place? So there seems to be several factors involved in FXR inhibition or the inhibition of this protein which sends a signal to the liver. So the key to any therapy is to provide the right tools and environmental conditions so that we can activate this enzyme system. Now, interestingly enough, FXR has been shown to reduce inflammation and maintain gut barrier integrity. So if someone is not getting FXR stimulation or FXR activation, then they are potentially going to also have a leaky gut and there may be some residual inflammation. And these kind of things that we're gonna be looking at are gonna differ from person to person. 
but here are some general principles which I found to be um, potentially implicated in this condition. So here's where it gets very interesting. So intestinal inflammation can actually reduce the activity of FXR. One study actually showed that intestinal inflammation strongly reduced FXR activation, probably via NF-kappa beta, okay? Uh, they concluded that therefore, FXR not only inhibits inflammation, but is also a target of, inf of the inflammatory response itself. This is where it gets really important. This could result in a vicious cycle where reduced FXR activity results in less repression of inflammation, contributing to the development of chronic intestinal inflammation. Okay. Likewise, prostaglandin D2, which is an inflammatory marker produced or formed by omega-6 fats, um, is also an antagonist for, for the FXR receptor. So we know that inflammation in the gut can potentially downregulate this crucial um, messenger, which is going to affect bile acid synthesis further down the line. Dysbiosis or intestinal bacterial imbalance also seems to be um, implicated in FXR. So there is some research to show that certain changes to gut bacteria can influence the FXR FGF19 pathway. A key factor I think that is involved is actually deficiency of the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A and vitamin D. So vitamin A and vitamin D play crucial roles in actually suppressing bile acid synthesis. Um, According to one study, vitamin A and vitamin D inhibit bile acid th synthesis by repressing hepatic expression of the rate-limiting enzyme CYP7A1. So vitamin A can actually um, reduce CYP7A1 expression, which puts, which slows down um, bile acid th synthesis and is therefore potentially therapeutic in bile acid malabsorption. There is another factor, and this is disruption of the internal circadian rhythm. So each of the organ systems has their own clock, or each of the cells has their own clock, and they need to be entrained by external stimuli, okay? And it has been shown that circadian regulation um, is intimately related to bile acid metabolism, and it's therefore possible that circadian dysregulation or an impaired circadian rhythm, so exposure to blue light in the evening time, um, exercise at the wrong times or not enough exercise, poor meal timings, these things can all influence the circadian rhythm and therefore are likely implicated in bile acid malabsorption. So as a general rule, we seem to have four key aspects of this. One is intestinal or systemic inflammation. Another one is vitamin A and vitamin D deficiency. Another one is dysbiosis of the gut microbes. And then another one is circadian dysregulation. Now, improving these things is gonna be highly individual. And for each different person, um, you are probably gonna to need to do different things. So without knowing your individual context, it's fairly difficult to make any solid recommendations on what you can do to fix those things. However, what we can do is actually make use of a variety of very specific botanical herbs and nutraceuticals, which have actually been shown to activate the FXR system, to activate that messenger to the liver to suppress bile acid synthesis. So you see, this is where plants can be used as medicines simply to put the brakes on inflammation and to kickstart the system back again. If we go back to this quote from one of the papers, it says, this could result in a vicious cycle where reduced FXR activity results in less repression of inflammation, contributing to the development of chronic intestinal inflammation. This means that temporarily supporting this system, putting the brakes on that inflammation, activating FXR could temporarily restore some balance and actually provide lasting benefit, whereby if FXR starts working again, if we start activating it as it should be, then this could have downstream effects 
to suppress levels of inf inflammation and actually break the vicious cycle. So one therapy that seems to work well for some people that I've tried with is actually to support the oxidative environment within the gut with ascorbic acid. So two to four grams per day in divided doses has actually um, produced the resolution of diarrhea in some people. There is another herb, and this is milk thistle. This is a herb which has typically been employed in liver support protocols, and it's been used for things like detoxification and everything. But the research shows that this is a potent activator of FXR. Okay, it contains um, certain substances called silymarin and silibilin. And what these do is they activate the FXR pathway and um, increase the levels of FGF19 circulating to the liver. Another one of the, um, the alkaloids found in certain herbs is called berberine. Now, berberine is found in Barbary and in Golden Seal, among others, and this has long been used in herbal medicine for the treatment of diarrhea. Well, berberine actually modulates the gut bacteria and it has downstream effects to activate FXR, to activate this pathway. Now finally, there is also artemensinin. Now this is an extract from uh, Artemisia, and artemensinin, again, increase the expression of FXR significantly. Now with these herbs, you need to be careful not to be taking any other medications which, contra which are contraindicated because these herbs can have an effect on certain enzymes in the liver and affect drug metabolism. However, these herbs have been used for hundreds if not thousands of years and seem to provide some benefit. Now, I personally, do not think that these herbs should be used long term. However, they can be used in temporary protocols to support this system and hopefully rebalance everything. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got any doses with me here. If you're gonna try these herbs, let me know. Um, post me a message in the comments. Let me know how, it, how, how you got on with that. I would be interested to see if you see any benefit. So if you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. You can find me on Facebook as EO Nutrition. My website is www.eonutrition.co.uk. Um, as I said, subscribe to my YouTube channel because I will be making more videos like this in the future. Um, thanks again and see you next time.